There we go. <laughs> All right. Praise God. It's great to be in the house of the Lord today. I want you to know that God loves you and I love you. And uh, do we have any announcements today that we need to make from the congregation? Stay for lunch. Yes, stay for lunch. There's tons of sweets, food. All right. Please. We're going to have a great lunch. This is uh, trying to generate some money for camperships today. And, uh, you know, last year we were able to send a cake. Uh, and, and so I don't know how many kids we have this year. But anyway, uh, come show up and have a great lunch and, and get your checkbook out. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, yes, John. I'm going to introduce my uh, cousin Natalie and her husband Jim. I'm up to see it.
join us? Uh, please join us as we are called to worship. Hear Jesus' great truth. I am the gate for the sheep. We recognize his voice. We've heard these words before. Come in. You belong here. You are safe and cared for here. We recognize the voice of our shepherd. Follow and find green pastures and still waters. We hear his voice. I come to give life and give it abundantly. Come on, come on. Let us pray together. Risen Savior, reliable shepherd, we hear your voice calling us to follow. We remember our ancient brothers and sisters who gathered in prayer and grace. Today we don't gather in prayer and grace. Enlighten us with your resurrection power, a power that frees us from despair. Enlighten us with your abundant life. May your living power flow through us in all we are and do. Our opening song is Savior by the Shepherd Lead Us. Um, we will sing verses 1 and 3. The words will be on the screen and can also be found on page 281 in the number.
today, Lord, we magnify your holy name. We just praise you, Lord God. You lead us beside the still waters, that you bring peace into and wholeness into our life. And Lord God, here today, we have several needs we need to lift up to you. We need to lift up to you uh, our brother Jerry Hacker today that uh, needs some strength in his body and he needs some help, Lord, and we just lift him up to you. We lift up to you and the Sauer family here today. This is a hard time losing their, uh, their sister, their cousin, Lord. Uh, but we rest in the fact that Kelly knew you, that Kelly had a relationship with you. And so bring comfort and strength to that family today. Lord, we lift up the activities here today to you uh, 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 that we might be able to raise some camperships and, and to send some kids to camp today. The Lord, that their lives would forever be changed towards you, Lord God, because we were able to send them to camp, that they would draw closer to you, and that they would remember that their church family uh, sent them to camp. It's one of the greatest times of their life. We're careful to give you honor and praise and glory when we pray these things in the name of the one you taught us to pray, our Father. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power.
the ushers to come forward. Uh, I would just like to say to you here this morning, before we receive the offering, I know we can get some money here lately, and that's the last thing the preacher really wants to do with us, and it is, uh, you know, make these pleas for money. And, and really, I have just been blessed to be your pastor because so many of you have responded to the call faithfully to help with this elevator and now with camperships. And I just, I just want to take a minute to tell you thank you for your faithfulness. And if you can give and, and feel good about it, and you're happy about it, I, as your pastor, I count that as a win. And so, thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, to you for your faithfulness today. So, with that, will the ushers please come forward to receive this morning's eyes and offerings? Let us pray. Lord God, we lift up your tithes and our offerings to you, that they might be a blessing, not only to this church, but to our local community, and to the world at large, Lord God. We thank, I thank you for the faithfulness of these, your people. And so this morning, I ask that you Bless both the gifts and the givers. In Jesus' name. leaving you an example 
so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth, and when he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sin, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you are going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is kind of a tough thing to, to preach about. Nobody likes to hear about pain and, and suffering and, and, and all that goes with all of that. Uh, nobody likes to hear about that, and I don't particularly like to preach about it because it can be kind of a downer. It really can be. So we're going to back up a little bit. We're going to talk about chapter 2. We're going to, we're going to talk about first, the whole book of First Peter. And then we're going to talk about chapter 2. And then we're going to get in uh, to our scripture here a little bit this morning. So First Peter, we don't know who actually wrote it. It could have been someone close to Peter. But for preaching sake, we are sticking to the story that it was Peter that wrote it. Well, this all happened uh, right when after Nero burnt Rome to the ground. And the backlash from the Roman citizens were, was that, you know, they didn't like it. They didn't like it that this was Nero's uh, solution to urban renewal is to burn the city in. So then Nero had to change the narrative a little bit, and so he had to look for a scapegoat, so he blamed the Christians. The Christians were easy to blame, so that along with that, there came a lot of persecution, and the Christians were displaced all across what was then called Asia Minor, uh, but it was different provinces in what we now know as modern-day Turkey. And so just because they were displaced didn't mean that they escaped persecution. They, they went through a tough time. And so here is Peter writing this letter to them as a word of encouragement uh, to them uh, and to let them know that this, uh, that they could be born anew, that they could be born again, and this was all made possible because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in, what, the third or fourth, third Sunday of Easter, I think, uh, so we're still recalling the events of the resurrection. So it was meant to be a word of encouragement. So, out of that, in Peter's infinite wisdom, he talks about, in the second chapter, he talks about slavery, and he talks about suffering, and he talks about pain. Now, first of all, I think this is kind of where our Bible gets a bad rap, is because people say, well, there's so much about slavery, Bible that, you know, Christianity seems to condone slavery. No, it does not condone slavery anywhere. But you have to contextualize what was going on at the time and place of this writing when Peter wrote this, where so many people were enslaved at that time in the Roman Empire, the commentaries say that there were 60 million slaves all across in the Roman Empire. And you know they didn't have a good time. 
So Peter was trying to console them and trying to give them some advice as to how to get through life uh, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, and at the same time uh, endure the pain and suffering that was inflicted upon them in this uh, terrible slavery uh, predicament that they were, so many people were in. It was just a terrible life, folks. It was just an awful life. You know, I want to tell you that, uh, and make my position clear on slavery, uh, it always has been and is now an abomination of God, or an abomination to God, and it is straight out of the pit of hell. Slavery is related to witchcraft and sorcery because that it is the domination of one person or people over another set of persons or people. And, and it's just terrible. It's awful. And you know what? It's still going on today. You know, the, the sex trafficking thing is alive and well. And we as Christians need to raise up a standard against it and uh, be stalwarts in prayer against slavery that people would be delivered out of that by the miracle, miraculous hand of God. So, pain and suffering happened then and it's still happening today. So that brings us to our scripture here today. Peter is recognizing that so many people have a lot of pain, a lot of suffering going on. And he wants to give them a word of encouragement. And so he tells them here, you know, if you, it is a credit to you, if you have this awareness of God, that you know that God is real, that he, he was and he is and he is alive today, uh, that you, it is a credit to you if you are enduring pain while suffering unjustly. If it's nothing that you have done or asked for uh, in your life and you're experiencing pain and you put your faith out there and believe and you endure through it, God sees you. God knows what you're going through. God is going to surround you and help you through it. So if you endure while you're beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? You know, I hope nobody today gets beat up, uh, physically beaten, especially in our local congregation for uh, doing wrong. Uh, but I suppose, you know, we still live in a wild world. But I tend to look at this more about life. Sometimes life just beats us up. And for various reasons, for various reasons, I, uh, especially physical, physical issues have affected our, our congregation in a big way. Uh, and people are beaten up about because they've got sick and it seems like things pile on one after another after another and you get down and you get out and you, you get to the place where you can't see a way back. So sometimes life beats you up and it's nothing you asked for. You know, we live in a fallen world, and we live in mortal bodies, and sometimes we get sick, and, and it just happens. But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. If you're out there putting your faith on the line for uh, building the kingdom of God, and uh, 
the world somehow comes against you in it, whether maybe on the workplace or, and, you know, if, with your, if you experience ridicule from your community or your family or your stand uh, for Christ, then God sees you in that also. God knows where you are and he'll help you with that and he'll give you strength to get through that. Uh, and so you just have to put your faith out there and endure. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Okay, this, this is uh, Christ has he's died on the cross and uh, he had a certain way of, of living and uh, being in the world that we should try to emulate. And so we're going to go through this. First of all, he committed no sin. Well, it's pretty unreasonable to think that us as human beings can go through life with never sinning. Uh, but look, at the same time, that's not a license for you to sin. Forgiveness is not is always there, but it's not a license for you to just go and do what you want because you know you'll be forgiven for it. Uh, so uh, there is a way back. Jesus meets you where you are. Uh, Jesus committed no sin. He knows that we uh, have our sinful creatures. He wants to forgive us. But he doesn't want us to leave us there. He doesn't want to leave us in sin. And that is where the Holy Spirit comes in, always uh, doing a work within us that is uh, meant to give us the power <coughs> to overcome sin. And if you've had a particular recurring sin of some type, that we have the strength and the power through the Holy Spirit to walk away from that, to turn 360 degrees in a different direction. Ah, there was no deceit found in his mouth. Jesus would not lie. Jesus faced up to his accusers, and when he was asked, uh, he did not lie. When he was asked about his life and about being the Son of God, he did not lie. He didn't try to weasel out of it. That he was truthful. And he didn't connive and try to uh, fit a, an agenda of any kind. There was no deceitful in him. So there's two things. We don't have to stay in sin. And uh, there should be no deceit found in our words. So here's the next one. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he entrusted himself to the one who justice, uh, judges justly. So what Jesus did is that when he was scourged, when he was beaten, when he was hung on the cross, he had the power to come down and smite all of them, if you will. He had the, the power to do that, but he chose not to. He chose not to retaliate. When you are in conflict, uh, the first thing that comes to mind, that come, a natural reaction, is fight or flight. Our example of Jesus was to stand there and take it and not retaliate. He wasn't retributed. He himself bore our, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Folks, I think this is the crux of this whole scripture right here. This is sort of a, this is a, a 
back in the promise. This is something that we can hold on to. They, this is what's called the atonement. Now, let me tell you what this is not. This is not divine child abuse, where God laid all this on to Jesus, uh, the suffering and the crucifixion and all that. God did not lay all that on Jesus so that we might be saved. God didn't do this to Jesus. It says here in the scripture, he himself, he himself, Jesus, is the one, as the Son of God, left himself open, left himself open to uh, the beatings, to being whipped, to being hung on the cross for our sins, for the sins of the world. Wasn't God that did this to him? It was actually humanity that did this to him. And he loved us so much that he left himself open to, to this happening to him. And so then, here on the, on the last but uh, of that scripture where it says here that uh, uh, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins we might live for righteousness by his wounds. Another, the King James, I think, says by his stripes we are healed. Yes, it's a little bit graphic, folks, but here we are back to the blood of Jesus again. There is, this is where our salvation is, is in the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. By his wounds, we, were, we are healed. By his stripes, we are healed. This, this is sort of all-encompassing. There's a fancy word called soteriology that encompasses uh, not only salvation that we think of as life eternal, you know, that we believe on Jesus and that we'll go to heaven. Uh, there is that. But it also encompasses our healing, both physical and emotional. It encompasses redemption. It, re it encompasses uh, deliverance. It's all wrapped up into this. By his stripes we are healed. Uh, that covers it all. Jesus' shed blood on the cross uh, covers it all for us. We were all going astray at one point in time, maybe multiple points in time. But Jesus makes a pathway to return to him. All you have to do is ask, believe, and confess. Jesus, save me. I believe in you, Jesus, and I confess Jesus is Lord. That's the way back to Jesus, time and time again. But he gives us this, by his stripes we are healed. I think I kind of covered and talked about, uh, and I see folks here that have uh, been through sickness, loss of a loved one. Things seem to pile up on them. It's easy to get down. It's easy to just let uh, life cover you over, beat you up. But you don't have to stay there in that folks. By his stripes we are healed. He himself bore our sins on the cross. And you know what's happening today? With Jesus. Jesus, he sits at the right hand of the Father. And he is like the great shepherd of our souls. He is the guardian of our souls. He's watching out of us. He's with us. He comes alongside of us. We can call on his name. We have his word. And we have his blood. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our final hymn is Just As I Am, About One Plea, number 356.
27, if you would stand. <laughs> Thank you. 